Billy Graham said that the deepest problems of the human race are spiritual in nature. They are rooted in man's refusal to seek God's way for his life. The problem is the human heart, which God alone can change. And all of us have that human heart, which God alone can change. <clears throat> Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. So we continue through the, the blessings, the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus is speaking to the people and he's laying out the foundations of his ministry. And, and you might remember that each of these Beatitudes seems to be building on the one previous to it. And that there's more depth to those Beatitudes than just, hey, everybody, be happy. Or, or just change your attitude. But Jesus wants us to know that as you give yourself to him, as you acknowledge your sin, as you recognize your own shortcomings, as you open up your heart, he wants to bless you. And now notice this one this week. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. I dare say that there's a few of us in the room who would probably say, I don't think my heart's very pure. <laughs> it's kind of hard to watch the news and stay have a pure heart, isn't it? <laughs> It's hard to watch movies today and have a pure heart or video games or even get on Facebook or other forms of social media and maintain a pure heart. It, it's hard to drive down the road sometimes and keep a pure heart. It's hard to be married sometimes and have a pure heart. It's only the guys who get upset, right? Today I want, to, I want to start this message with this focus, and that is that pure hearts are clean hearts, not perfect hearts. Pure hearts are clean hearts, not perfect hearts. And how do you get clean? Jesus, when he was washing the feet of the disciples, he's there in that upper room and he's, he's carrying on that, that great feast with them, the last Passover meal that he would have with them. And he's totally changing this meal. Not only did he wash their feet, but he's going to make a new covenant with them and it's going to be formed with his blood. He's going to commemorate a whole different kind of a meal because he's now the perfect Passover lamb. And Jesus answered to said, was that those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. When Jesus was saying that, he was saying, look, you're clean. Why? You're clean because of me. But not every one of you because, well, one of you is planning on betraying me. One of you is rejecting me as Messiah. In John 15, 3, he'll go on and he'll say, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Take notice, it's the living word that Christ has spoken that makes the disciples already clean. Now what's amazing about that is, when did that happen? Before he went to the cross. He's already been in the process of cleaning them up <laughs> by what he's been teaching them, by the word he's been planting in them, him, himself, literally, that he's been starting to plant in them. Notice, remember, that the disciples even had already had the Holy Spirit come upon them in various ways. Not the, not the full way yet, right? But, but they had power to cast out demons, to heal the sick, to, to call people to repentance. All that because the power of the Spirit had come. God was already working in their lives. He says, you're already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Not perfect, but clean. Hebrews 10, 22 says, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. When you sin, what do you feel? If you're, if you're being honest about the fact that you've sinned, you're going to probably have some guilt, aren't you? If you don't, uh, tell me and we'll start praying that you get that feeling. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. 
You might remember that Jesus spoke a lot about the Pharisees and the religious leaders and the Sadducees and how they were going through all kinds of rituals to cleanse themselves on the outside. And he says, no, I want to clean you from the inside out. So in James 1, 27, it says, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. Here you go. Here's the key. Here's how to say, okay, how, how can I know if I'm going to have a good heart, if I have a pure heart? Look at what he says. To look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. Don't fall into the sins of the world. Take care of the people around you that, that can't take care of themselves without assistance, the widows and the orphans. <clears throat> By the way, the word here for, for pure is, is a word that that's our root word for catharsis, cathartic. Um, it's, the idea is this one thing I do, excuse me, it, it's describes a heart which is pure in motive and it, which exhibits single-mindedness, undivided devotion, and spiritual integrity. A pure heart is not perfect, but it's undivided in its commitment to God. Are you that? Are you undivided in what you're doing for the Lord? Are you undivided in your commitment to Him? I forget, I'm sorry, I thought I wrote down the, the, the theologian who said this, but he says, the basic idea is that of integrity, singleness of heart, as opposed to duplicity, a double heart, a divided heart. When God cleanses sinners and makes them his children, he does more than merely wash away sin. He puts within them a new heart that wants to focus wholly on God. A pure heart is a heart that's focused on God. Are you? You see, God wants to give us a heart transplant. Do you remember, I remember it's been about 30, 40 years, something like that. Remember when they had that, that heart, that machine that they connected to the person, I believe it was in Arizona, and it was, a, it, it literally, it was pumping and it became, it was a mechanical heart for a person. Now it was, it, it was large and the person couldn't get out of the room, uh, but, the, but it was now an operator. Well, today they can do so much more, can't they? I remember lying on that table with my first angiogram thinking, oh Lord, I, the doctor told me uh, when we went in that I was going to be having bypass surgery. Like, I was not looking forward to that. Being a pastor, I visited way too many people in the hospital where they had the chest cut open, right? Some of you may have had that. You know, cut open that chest, the ribs are moved like this, and they work on the heart, and then they put that all back together, and there's wires going around those ribs, and everyone hurts later from, from the cut ribs. And I'm like, I really don't want to do this. But the doctor, had literally just two days before, had said, you got to have this, you're going to die, and, you're, and, and, and we have to do it right now. So fortunately, I didn't have a lot of time to think about it. So one night sitting on the sofa, don't move, is what the doctor said. And then went in the next morning. And then um, it was interesting because um, afterwards, the doctor said, you know, uh, you kept stopping breathing on us. My heart didn't stop, but I stopped breathing while I was laying there on the table. And I was wondering, because I had been watching, all of a sudden I didn't see anything. I mean, everything just didn't remember anything. God wants to give us a new heart. He wants to do surgery on us and change us from the inside out. You see, when we accept Christ, we become his children, right? We're, we're children of God. We, we've now bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. We, a new covenant has been formed. And in fact, listen to what Jeremiah says. They will be my people, and I will be their God. I will give them singleness of heart and action. That's a pure heart. So that they will always fear me, and that all will then go well for them and for their children after them. I will make an everlasting covenant with them. I will never stop doing good to them, and I will inspire them to fear me so that they will never turn away from me. A pure heart is undivided. Fears, respects, honors God, puts God first, doesn't give in to any other idols. So this morning, as we look at this passage, I want to ask you, what's inside your heart? What's inside your heart?
In Matthew 23, Jesus said, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will be clean. The Pharisees were doing a great job of, of making a show that looked really clean. Their clothing looked really special. It was very obvious when they would pray, even more obvious when they would fast. They went through all the rituals and everyone knew they were going to go through all the water cleansings and stuff, all the purification rites. And, it was, and they did it in front of people so people would know that they were pure on the outside. And Jesus says, you know, you look great on the outside, but it's the inside of your heart where the real dirt is. It's the inside of your heart that I'm most concerned about. So Jesus goes on, he says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. Yuck. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy. Hypocrisy and wickedness. Now, when you say that most of us, when we come to church, we see people and we kind of like, you know, oh, they look really pretty good. In fact, sometimes people get a little bit uncomfortable because everyone else looks good and inside you're thinking like, I'm a, am I the only one here that's messed up? Am I the only one who sinned this week? These guys all look like they're just perfect. And then there's me. And the problem is Jesus wants us to understand is that we all have some stuff inside. All of us. In Matthew 15, Jesus talks about this further. He says, but the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart. And these defile them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person. But eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. What makes you dirty is what comes out of your heart. I should have pointed this out early on, that the heart, when you look in Greek thinking, the heart is not the place of emotion. The heart, we may actually better connect with our, our mind. Because the heart is the place where we think, where we start our sinning, right? <laughs> where does sinning begin? And your thoughts. Temptations come here, right? Into the head, into the thought patterns. And that is what the Greek is referring to when it refers to the heart. I'm wondering, for me personally, I want a heart that's unmixed in its devotion and motivation. And I'm wondering, would you like to have a heart like that? Unmixed in your devotion and motivation. In other words, you're not putting something else in it, but you're committed totally, devoted completely. Your motivation stems from what Jesus wants for you. Proverbs 20, verse 9 says, Who can say, I have kept my heart pure, I am clean and without sin? Uh, can anyone do that today? Anyone online? Maybe there's more of you there who can say that. Who can say, I've kept my heart pure, I am clean and without sin? Well, you all look like you have. We got you fooled. Got me fooled, yes. <laughs> but seriously, I mean, I look around the room and I'm like, wow, you're all great. But the writer of Proverbs, Solomon says, who really can say, I've kept my heart pure, I am clean and without sin? Ray Pritchard uh, said that, uh, he was speaking to a counselor, and the counselor said that he often tells his counselees, you're only as sick as your secrets. 
The more you have to hide, the sicker you are. And if you've got a lot of secrets, you're really sick. See how, so how secret are we about what's inside of us? Pritchard goes on to ask, is your life an open book? Can, can people see inside of the book to see what you are really like? Or do you have things that you hide from your best friends and from your loved ones? Is there anyone in your life who knows the truth about who you really are? Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Could I remind you of 1 John and what the Lord was trying to teach us through John when he says this, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. By the way, be careful. Don't be the Pharisee who's over there saying, oh, well, at least I'm not as bad as that guy. And don't, don't go do the comparison thing. Just deal with you and Jesus. If you want to make a comparison, compare yourself to Jesus. And then see how well you do. Because when you compare yourself to Jesus, you're going to say, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. So if you say you don't have sin, you're saying God's a liar. The one I told you to compare yourself with Jesus, right? So if you say, oh, I, I haven't done anything. Now you're comparing yourself to Jesus, right? And in comparison to him, I don't think you're going to bear very well. And if you claim to have not sinned, then you're saying, Jesus, you're a liar. Those are tough words. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the people whose hearts have been cleaned by Jesus Christ. For they will see God. You remember the story of Moses and his experience with God? Exodus 33 tells us some of it. In verse 9, it says, As Moses went into the tent, this is, they've got the tent of meeting, and Moses would go in there. That's what it's called that, right? It's a meeting place for Moses to meet with God. Everyone else had to stay outside. What was really interesting is that the people would stand at the front of their tent, and they'd watch when Moses went into the tent of meeting. Uh, and when Moses would come out of there, remember his face shone bright, and, and he had to cover it, and, and, and as it as it went away, he kept it covered because he didn't want people to know that he was never glo no longer glowing. Uh, what's interesting is, is that when you look at Exodus 33, it says that Joshua stayed at the tent of meeting. Moses went in, met with God, had this incredible moment with him. Then Moses would leave. He'd actually go in there and, and, and listen to what it says. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Moses is an incredible person. He doesn't have to have a dream for God to speak to him. He doesn't get it from somebody else. He has a direct communication link with God. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and worshipped, each at the entrance to their tent. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young aide Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. Incidentally, there's a real discipleship moment here, isn't there? Joshua, who will take over for Moses, when? <laughs> over 40 years later. Over 40, because he's going to wander in the wilderness with the rest of them when they're punished for not going into the promised land like Joshua and Caleb said they should do, but they decide not to. So, so 40 years later, finally, Joshua is going to take over. And yet, look here, Joshua is getting to witness God meeting with Moses. Now, there's a phrase here. <coughs> and let me read further, and you see if there's a difference here. The phrase was... 
the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. But the fact is, Moses didn't see God's face, did he? Well, it's not a contradiction, just wait. Verse, verse 18. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. He's actually going to reveal his name, which is identity. Remember, the name of God was so special that the Jews didn't even speak it out loud. And he says, I'm going to proclaim my name. You're going to hear it right here in front of you, Moses. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Moses, God is opening up something for Moses that he's never known before, that God is compassionate, merciful, and will be merciful to whom he desires to be merciful. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock, cover you with my hand until I pass by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back. But my face must not be seen. Now, do, do we have a contradiction going here? <laughs> Didn't it just say that Moses met with God and met with him face to face like a friend would meet with a friend. And now God says, uh, sorry, you can't look at my face. You see, my face is going to kill you. And it's not because it doesn't look good. It's because of the purity of God will just destroy the impurity of Moses. The face to face phrase that comes in the first portion is, is clarified with that other phrase. Did you hear it? Like a friend talks to a friend. And what they were saying there was that in the tent of meeting, that, that God and Moses met like friends. Not frightening God whom he couldn't be with, but they met like friends. And later he's saying, but you can't see my face. You can't literally look directly into my face. In other words, you can't look into my purity. You can't look at me and see me in your impurity, Moses, because it will destroy you. So I'm going to put my hand over your face. I'm going to hide you here in the rock. And once I go by, you'll be able to just look at my glory from behind. Didn't the disciples look in the face of God? Isn't Jesus God? Amen. So then they got to look in the face of God, didn't they? Ah, but remember again, what did Jesus say in John 15? No longer do I call you servants, but I call you what? Friend. Because a friend knows and does the work of the Lord. I have built this relationship with you. I've connected to you as a friend, just like Moses did with God Almighty. <clears throat> then Jesus said to his disciples, did I not tell you that if you believe you will see the glory of God. This is just like Moses. If you believe, you're going to see God work, just like Moses did. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, The God of this age, however, and this is sad, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. But how sad for those who are blinded by the God of this world, whose personal interests and selfish thoughts, whose sin keeps them from seeing the glory of God.
In Matthew 13, Jesus said, for this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears and they have closed their eyes. And otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts and turn and I would heal them. And I'm wondering today, how much do we want to see God? Uh, isn't that the goal ultimately? You leave here, you die, you go to heaven, and who do you want to see first? Hopefully God. <laughs> Excuse me, God, I was uh, hoping to see if uh, somebody else is here. <laughs> I have two friends I'm looking for, uh, and I want to check it out. You know, I've been waiting to look for them. I don't think so. When you get to heaven, it's like, can I see Jesus? <laughs> I don't even think you'll have to ask, though, will we? Blessed are the pure in heart. For when they get to heaven, they see Jesus. They see God. You know, John 1, 18 says, No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who, him, who is himself God, and is in closest relationship with the Father has made him known. When you've seen Jesus, you've seen God because he is God. First John 3. See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Don't you want to see God? I know some of you say, well, maybe not yet, right? And most of you have plans and you're not ready to go see God yet. But, but don't you want to see God face to face, look him in the eye? Did you hear it in that first song that we were singing about seeing his love? We want to look at him. And when you look at Jesus, you're going to see and feel and experience love like you've never even experienced it here, even though we've already been given his love. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Do you remember what I said at the beginning? A pure heart is not a perfect heart. A pure heart is a clean heart. And how does it get clean? By the blood of the Lamb of God. Psalm 51, David said, create in me a pure heart. I don't have one. <laughs> I have a very imperfect heart. I've sinned against you, God. So God, create in me a pure heart, O oh God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. David says, God, clean my heart. It's messed up. I've turned from you. I've, I just, I've blown it. God, give me that clean heart again because I look so much. I have so much desire, so much hunger just to be with you, God, just to be close to you, God. As I was preparing this message, I was asking the Lord, okay, so, so what are we supposed to do with this, okay? Pretty much you all have clean hearts, right? How can we all so quiet today? Don't you all have clean hearts? Yes. I mean, did, okay, let me ask it a different way. Have you invited Jesus to live in your life? Yes. Have you said yes to him being Lord of your life? Yes. Have you accepted his forgiveness for your sin? Yes. Then don't you have a clean heart? Yes but not a perfect heart. <laughs> You've still got stuff you do. You're, you're as much like David as anybody else. You're still imperfect, but you have a clean heart because of what God himself has done. Yes? But do you have room in your heart for more of Jesus? 
One of the most moving little booklets I've ever read is My Heart Cries Home by Bob Munger, in which he describes his home and the various rooms in that home. There's the study and the fireplace room where you can meet with God. There's the kitchen where you get your nourishment and all that. Uh, there's the stinky room upstairs with all the garbage in it and it's locked and shut and you don't let anybody in there because it's too private and too nasty and you don't want anyone to see all your garbage and that's the room Jesus wants to clean out. Do you have room in your heart for Jesus? From what you all said, most of you here this morning, I don't know about online, but here this morning you've said, Jesus is in my heart. I've accepted him. I've accepted his payment. He's forgiven me. He's, he loves me. I've, I've, yes, I belong to him. I'm forgiven. I've got a clean heart. But my question is this. Is Jesus a guest in your house or does he own it? Does Jesus just have a room in your heart where you let him stay? Maybe you don't even bother him at times. You may even keep the door shut so that he doesn't see the other stuff in the house. Does he have a room? Or have you become a guest in his house? And that's what Bob Munger tried to teach us my heart cries home. And Bob reached that point where he said, okay, Lord, you've had the place here, you've been a guest here, but it's time for me to sign over the house totally to you. And I want to live in your house. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Jesus, we're really honest about it. <laughs> We're really imperfect. We, God, we've got stuff in our heart that we'd rather you didn't even see. We probably have some rooms that we've kept closed. We're embarrassed, we're ashamed of them. There's garbage in there that we just wouldn't want you to have to look at. But those rooms are rooms that we can't clean ourselves. We need your help. Jesus, come. Purify our hearts. Jesus, come cleanse us. And Jesus, We want to turn over the house, our home, our heart, to your ownership. Thank you for this incredible promise that the pure in heart will see you. Thank you that there's ways that we can start to see you here on earth it's like Moses and Joshua, the disciples, Paul, and many, many others. Thank you that we'll also one day get to see you face to face in all of your glory. Oh, hallelujah to the Lamb of God. In the name of Jesus, amen.